Thank you and thank you. What a privilege it is to join you this morning in singing the praises of, of the Lord Jesus and meditating on the truth of the gospel. Paul said in chapter 1, I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes. There's a power in the gospel itself, and Romans is his most complete exposition of what the gospel is. There's a power in that. He said, I want to come to Rome so I can have a harvest among you, the Christians in Rome, as I preach the gospel. That's the immediate context of Romans 1.16 is I'm going to come preach the gospel to you and have a harvest among you. Yeah, the Gentiles too and the others in, in Rome, but I want to see a harvest of righteousness, a growth and a progress for the gospel that comes as we hear and understand and apply the gospel to our own lives. And of course, we're going to focus on the end of, of Romans 8 that um, John Piper said, the book of Romans is the best book in the Bible and chapter 8 is the best chapter in the book of Romans. So chapter 8 is arguably the best chapter in the Bible. Um, Spurgeon called it the diamond of scripture. And we're going to focus on the conclusion of that. But let me just briefly share my experience of the gospel. I grew up, as I said, in an evangelical free church, a Bible teaching, gospel preaching church in the Chicago suburbs. And so from my earliest days, my parents were teaching me about Jesus and salvation. And I was singing the great hymns like, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. I would often fall asleep under the pews or try and crawl for the exit, but dad would grab my heel and pull me back. We were Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, kids program. Uh, we had a program in middle school and high school called Bible Quizzing, where we would study scriptures. Uh, one year, I, I worked on Romans and James, and we competed all over the Midwest on Bible memory. Um, a lot of what I know from scripture goes back to those days of competition. Um, so I grew up going to church all the time, but my predominant feelings about God were guilt and fear. I knew that God was holy. We sang about that. I knew he was righteous. I also knew he was omniscient, which meant he knew everything that was going on in my life, even if my mom didn't. And my mom still has some you know, delusions that we let her hold on to about my childhood. <laughs> but God has none of those. He knows everything that we think, feel, and do. And so I, especially through my teenage years, I increasingly felt guilt when it came to how I, how I thought about God, and that produced in me fear and a lack of assurance of where I stood with the Lord. Two things changed that. One was a youth leader who I eventually worked up the courage to share my struggles with, and instead of preaching condemnation, I wasn't sure if he'd go straight to my parents or straight to the elders. You know, you hear a confession from a, a seventh grader, what do you do with that? Instead, he took me to Arby's, bought me a Jamocha shake, and told me about the unconditional grace of God. I'll never forget this cartoon. He took me through, I think, a navigator's study, where it had a picture of a cartoon kid who had trashed his dad's car. And he said to me, now, if you, if you wrecked your dad's brand new 91 Mustang, would he be mad at you? I was, oh, I, yeah, I'd be working in the garage with him for years to pay that back. But would he still be your dad? I'll never forget that question. Would he still be your dad. Nothing can change that relationship. That's what Paul's saying in the end of Romans 8, isn't he? If once you understand the love of God, you'll see that even the love of the best father on earth is just a tiny glimpse of the unconditional, unchangeable, permanent love of God. That was the first thing that helped me understand, okay, there's a security here that I hadn't understood before. Then about a year later, I went to a big youth conference and heard a speaker say, Nothing you do can make God love you more. Nothing you do can make God love you less. I remember looking, like, as I heard these words, looking over to my youth pastor to see if he was shaking his head. You know, to see if it was like, it seemed to me, growing up in church and growing up in, in the 80s, when there was like this holiness emphasis, right? Where it was like, here's what we do as Christians, here's what we don't do. We don't watch movies on Sunday, was a rule in my church. You know, we don't play cards on Sunday. Monday, it's fine. Sunday, it's not. We don't listen to any secular music. No rock. So my friends, in, you know, it, it was like these, these are dangerous, you know, worldly influences if they're listening to. We had rules. And so my understanding of that was, well, if you follow the rules, God loves you more. Your points go up. 
you break some of the rules, you, your points go down or they're gone, right? Or you're in the negative. So hearing that, nothing you do can make God love you more. Nothing. I, I remember wrestling with that in my mind saying, is that really true? Can the gospel, is the good news really that good? And that's when, as a young teenager, I began to realize it's actually far better than I ever understood. And, and you can see where what, that, what they began to do in my life, peace and assurance took over where there had been fear. Joy began to grow in my heart where there had been guilt because of the gospel. That's what my youth leaders were doing for me. They were helping me understand the fullness of the gospel. I, I like to say we often think of the gospel in one dimension, like it's just a flat line and you get saved, right? And it's just this line that you cross, now you're saved. Hallelujah, praise the Lord. But that, we think of it as like this flat line that then you're forgiven and you go to heaven. Like the, the third grade Sunday school teacher asked her class, what do you have to do to go to heaven? And the kids look at each other, they're thinking, they're thinking, and finally one of them bravely says, what do you have to do to go to heaven? Well, you have to die, right? And we often think that's all the gospel is, is a ticket to heaven. That when you die, you go to heaven because you've been forgiven by the Lord Jesus. That's a flat, one-dimensional gospel. The gospel is the entire Christian life. J.D. Greer says it's not just the diving board that gets you into a relationship with Christ. It's the whole pool. It's the whole life. It's, it's everything about what Jesus has done for us. I like to say it's three-dimensional. It's past, present, and future. It's every moment of our Christian life is wrapped up in the gospel. And if you just turn back in, in Romans 8, just go back to the beginning and see what, I'm going to give you a summary, because I've just been preaching through Romans 8 in six weeks, so I'm going to give you all of it in one minute. You ready? In five Fs, okay? What is the gospel? First of all, it's forgiveness, right? There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. No condemnation. As soon as you put your faith in Jesus, you, you are translated from being dead in sin to being alive in Christ. God looks at you. He doesn't see your sins anymore because you are forgiven. The debt has been paid. It's been applied to the account of Christ. It is no longer on you, and you are free from that forgiveness. Forgiveness. Verse 2, the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. Not only are we forgiven in Christ, we are free. There's a new law that is operative. Before Jesus, the law that governs the non-believer is the law of sin that leads to the law of death, physically and eternally. But over the Christian, there's a new law, the law of the spirit of life. We're not only forgiven, we are free. There's a power that the Lord places inside of us, which ties to the third F, which is filled Verse 4, those who walk, not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. At the moment of salvation, the Holy Spirit comes to live in your brand new regenerated heart. You're no longer filled with selfishness and sin. God changes that. His Holy Spirit comes in and begins to change you from the inside out. Forgiven, free, filled, and focused is the fourth F as you look at verse 5 through 8. Set the mind not on the flesh but on the Spirit. That's the life of the Christian. To increasingly choose to set our mind on the Spirit inside of us and not the world and not our old ways of thinking and acting. And the last F is what we'll focus on today. Because of the gospel, because of who we are now in Christ, we, are, we should be fearless. Fearless in the face of any opposition, any persecution, you hear these lists. Now turn back to the end of, of Romans 8. Tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, danger, sword. We, we started talking here this morning when I was just connecting with people about hurricanes because we got here, you know, literally eight days before Hurricane Irma was our welcome. We moved down from Chicago and see almost immediately weather reports of this hurricane coming that's aimed right at us. Our whole church stayed, but we left. We took off. We we moved the worship service to Friday night, loaded the minivan, had the, the, the boys and the um, dogs in the car, and we took off and drove to Birmingham. Probably the most dangerous single thing I've ever done as a human being was leaving Tampa at 8 o'clock before a hurricane and driving. We didn't get to Birmingham. It was the first hotel we could find uh, until like 4 in the morning. 
We were far closer to death on those Georgia roads than we ever would have been here. Although our, our townhouse would have been without power for five days, so that is pretty rough, I understand, in uh, August in, in Florida. But um, well, we started talking about hurricanes and earthquakes and tornadoes and, and these things. And those are some of our most fearful things, right, as Americans who have a pretty comfortable lifestyle. Look at the list. He doesn't mention hurricanes and earthquakes, right? Paul is talking about tribulation. He's talking about persecution. Nero had just, this is probably, Romans probably written in the late 50s, 56, 57. Nero had just become emperor at the age of 16. The most notorious, notoriously mentally unstable emperor in Rome was Nero. The, the one who would, would light Rome on fire and then blame the Christians for it. And then as retribution would tie Christians to stakes and light them like torches to illumine his festival along, all around the city of Rome. I mean, this was a delusional, tyrannical emperor who would end up taking his own life at the age of 30, but before that would end the lives of both Peter and Paul in Rome. So what Paul's writing here about tribulation and persecution and famine and nakedness and sword is not abstract. We, we will apply it today in some abstract ways. Whatever our suffering, right? Whatever our challenges, whatever we're called to go through, for Paul, this was not abstract. For the believers in Rome, these were real, tangible dangers that many of them would very soon face. He's asking these questions, can any of that separate us from the love of God? These two lists, the second one then gets into even spiritual forces, death and life, rulers and authorities and powers and height and depth and anything else in, in all creation. Is there anything physical, anything in the spiritual realm that can break our relationship with the Lord? You see these lists and the beginning of this section has four questions. You see what Paul's doing rhetorically? He's bringing a contrast between the physical and the spiritual, Right? Think about persecution, opposition. Think about the worst that could happen. What does he mean by height or depth? I, I wrestled with that in recent weeks. What a height or depth? Like, what's the worst thing Emperor Nero could do to you? He could take you up on a mountain, I guess, and tie you there and leave you there in the snow. Or he could chain you to a cannonball and drop you in the middle of the ocean. Height and depth, right? Not only physical death, but then what's going to happen to your remains? The first century, they were concerned about resurrection and how that worked. And if you're if your physical body is in the bottom of the ocean, is that a problem for your resurrection, right? If you're tied up on some mountain somewhere, no one can recover your body. Is that a problem for your... Anyone ever been to Jerusalem? You know, in Jerusalem, the outside of the city walls to the east where the Mount of Olives is, is nothing but tombstones. Huge, ornate stone cemetery. Because the Jews wanted to get as close to Jeru you can't bury within the city walls, but they wanted, for the sake of their resurrection, they wanted to be as close to where the Messiah, they knew he'd be coming down to Jerusalem. They wanted to be as close as they could. They were concerned about a good resurrection. You think the danger Paul's addressing there, I wonder, with height and depth, is like, what's the worst that could happen to your body? You know, I suppose it could be burned up and turned to little carbon atoms, right? Is that a problem for your resurrection? He says, no, there's no... There's no danger, there's no challenge with there. Anything that happens to you, nothing can change your relationship with the Lord. And that's what he focuses on in those questions. If God is for us, who can be against us? Who can bring any charge against us? Who can condemn us? Who can separate us? Do you see what those questions are doing? They're saying the physical is one thing, but the spiritual is the main question we need to wrestle with. And if we have confidence in the spiritual security we have in Christ, then the physical fades into the distance, doesn't it? Very similar to what Jesus said in Mark chapter 8, when he said, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Whoever would save his life will lose it. Arguably, this was the center of Jesus' message was, listen, everybody, you have a choice. You can choose this world, this kingdom, or my world, my kingdom, right? Basically, Jesus is saying, I'm the Messiah, I am the king. You can serve me as your king, or you can reject me and serve 
any other king. Whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels, that's the one who will save it. What does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? I think Paul is saying something similar in Romans 8. We all have a choice. Everyone on the planet has a choice. You can choose your physical comfort, your physical safety, and risk forfeiting your soul. Or you can choose to protect your soul in Christ and risk forfeiting your earthly, earthly life. Persecution forced that question in the first couple centuries of the church. Christians had to literally choose. Will I pledge my worship to Caesar, in this case Nero, or to another king? Many Christians had to lose their lives or lose their livelihoods in order to answer that question. That literal question may not be too far in our future here in America. If it came down to it and it would cost you your job or your retirement or your pension, if you name the name of Jesus, if you were accused of a hate crime, of intolerance for standing on the truth and authority of God's word and insisting on something, let's say, gender, and saying otherwise was becoming a hate crime, would you hesitate? Would you stand for the name of Jesus if it cost you your livelihood, if it cost you your family member, if it cost you your life? Do you see, these weren't abstract concepts in the distant possible future. These were real for the Christians that Paul was writing to. But he says in verse 37, no, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. No height, nor depth, nor anything else will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. So my, the application for today, I'm going to give you up front, and then we'll walk back through the gospel truth that we'll celebrate today. The application is... Sorry, let me find it. The application is that we should, as Christians, we should fear nothing, fear nothing, and use everything we have for Jesus. Very simple application today. Fear nothing. And use everything you have for Jesus, for his kingdom, for his, his work. What we'll see today is the, the two sides of the love of God. That's in the end the great promise of the gospel. Nothing can separate us from his love. What does that love look like? I'm going to give you five gospel truths in these two categories of the love of God. We heard Josh McDowell speak, the great apologist for Christianity. Uh, and and he, he was explaining, he raised two daughters and a son, I think. And he said for his daughters, he, he wanted to define what love is. He's like, they're going to start dating these you know, young men. And I want to be clear on what love is and isn't. And so he said, you look at Ephesians 5, where it talks about Christ's love for the church and, and husband and wife love. And it says he nourishes and cherishes. That's what a Christian husband does for his wife, nourishes and cherishes. And McDowell translated that to protect and provide. To cherish something is to protect it, like fine china. To nourish is to care for, to think of whatever that person needs. Protect and provide. He said, girls, if, if you're dating a boy and he says he dares to say the words that he loves you, you ask him, is this what you mean? Do you mean you're committed to protecting me, to what's best for me in my health and safety? Are you committing to providing for me? And what I need, what I want, that's love. That's the love of Christ for us. He protects us. He provides for us. So let's look first at our protection that we have in Christ. The first gospel truth in that is reconciliation. Verse 31 and 32, If God is for us, who can be against us? He who didn't spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, the great gospel doctrine of reconciliation. Jesus' death on the cross fully satisfies the just wrath of God. If God is for us, who can be against us? Do you feel that truth today? How is your relationship with God? Do you feel peace with God? Or were you, are you feeling like I was as a teenager? Where you feel guilt and fear because you're not sure you've been fully reconciled with him. This is the first outcome of the gospel, is that we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Because of his 
finished work, the conflict that was there between us and God has been resolved. The wrath that should have fallen on us has now fallen on him. You can't talk about reconciliation where there wasn't conflict. Reconciliation means there was conflict. If a couple gets divorced and they live separately for several years, but then they reconnect and they start talking and they eventually rekindle the reason that they loved each other and they get back together, we call that a reconciliation. But it's a reconciliation that has overcome conflict where two people, instead of seeing each other as enemies, come together again and see each other as friends. They've made peace together. You can only have reconciliation where there was conflict. That's what we need to understand. In a day when the liberal movement out there wants to say everyone's fine, I'm okay, you're okay, let's not even talk about sin, it's not even really a problem, we're all born children of God, that's the idea. And yes, we know God so loved the world. He loves everyone. He gives everyone an opportunity to hear and respond. But everyone is not automatically a child of God. You're only a child of God by adoption. Through personal faith in the Lord Jesus. The default setting for everyone on earth is not to be a child of God, but an enemy of God. Romans 5 says, while we were enemies, Christ died for us. That's how he accomplished Reconciliation. What does an enemy of the king deserve but punishment, death, and separation? That's the first gift of the gospel. Jesus' death fully satisfies the wrath of God. So the believer is no longer God's enemy but has become God's child. And we'll see more of an application to that in the end. That's the first truth. The second one ties into that uh, graphic that you got in, in front of you. Not only reconciliation do we have in Christ but justification. Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Faith in Jesus connects the believer to the infinite grace of God to not only forgive your sins, but to give you credit for the righteousness of Jesus. This is the great gospel truth of the book of Romans. Justification by faith alone. Ruling out any possibility of our works adding to our final end of the day declaration of righteousness from God. Before his, the word justification is a courtroom term. The judge issues his verdict at the end of the day and pronounces you either just or unjust, righteous or unrighteous. Our legal system says guilty or not guilty. This is far more significant than that, isn't it? The pronouncement of righteousness to be justified is not only to be pronounced forgiven it's to be pronounced righteous i like to think of it in terms of if you were dating a wealthy person let's say you graduated from college and had half a million dollars in college debt and credit card debt but you were dating a very wealthy person a billionaire what would happen the day you got married a sensible money manager would immediately pay off your debt right he writes a check, his account goes down by that half a million, and your debt is gone, right? It's paid for. Those debt collectors can't come chasing you because someone is paid. You didn't pay, but it's paid. That's, that is forgiveness. You see that red deficit below the line. If you added up every sin, every thought, every attitude, every word, every deed, it creates a negative deficit added to your tally. And do you think there's accountants in heaven keeping up with this? Revelation tells us there are. Books that will be opened in the end, documenting everything people have ever done and said and thought, unless your ledger has been nailed to the cross. That's the great truth of justification. But we know it's not just the negative removal of our sin, it's the positive credit for his righteousness, that's the above-the-line credit. What else happens on the day you marry a wealthy man? Yes, he pays off your debt, but assuming it's a healthy marriage without an elaborate prenup, right? You now have access to everything that is his. All of his bank accounts and investment accounts become yours. All of his resources and assets, his home in the Bahamas or in Vail, right? All of his vehicles and transportation, all of these things. We think of it monetarily and stuff, but now think of it. Not financially, but in terms of righteousness. 
This is what happens at the moment of saving faith. This is our doctrine of justification. Yes, your sins are forgiven. They're nailed to the cross. But at that same moment in the great exchange of the gospel, Jesus takes his complete perfection and puts it on you like a robe, dressed in his righteousness alone, faultless to stand before the throne. It's a robe that is way too big for us, right? And we stumble and we trip and we don't, but we grow into it through the Christian life. This is our doctrine of justification. We're reconciled. We're justified. The third gospel truth that comes under this protection we have in Christ is representation. Who can condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died, and now he's at the right hand of God, and he is interceding for us. Do you see the progression of Paul's questions here? If God is for us, who can be against us? Who can even make an accusation? What is Satan's job? He is the great accuser. He is the one who would, he's the prosecuting attorney who would come and make a case against you, but you can't be accused anymore because your sins have already been paid for. How can you possibly be condemned if no one can even accuse you? In attempting to accuse or condemn you, the finger would be pointing not at you, but at Jesus himself. He stands between you in judgment. This is the great picture of the final judgment for the Christian. Jesus, of course, is the final judge of all people. Everyone will stand before him in judgment. Before the Christian, he will get down from his judgment seat, come and stand in front of you and say to the Father, this one's with me. Proceedings completed, right? And escort you into the kingdom. The great gospel truth of representation. Our great high priest stands between us and judgment, between us and our sin. When God looks at you, he doesn't see you. He sees Jesus. What did did God the Father say to God the Son? This is my beloved Son. With him I am well pleased. Do you hear that gospel truth for you today? Not because we're so amazing, but because God's grace is so amazing. When he looks at you, he sees the finished work of Christ. He sees the perfection of Jesus standing before you, representing you. That's the protection that we have in Christ. Now let's look at the other half of the love of God. Not only his perfection, but also his provision. He not only cherishes us, he nourishes us in Christ. Two more gospel truths to celebrate this morning. Verse 39, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. He summarizes all the blessings we have in Christ in one word. The word love. Our best human relationships give us the best possible glimpse of the relationship God wants with us. A relationship of love. If you had good loving parents who cared for you, protected and provided for you, it's a glimpse, right, of God's love. If you're in a loving, healthy marriage, that service, that sacrifice, that love is a glimpse of the kind of love God has for us. And I think probably our best example is the love we have for our own children. It's probably when we come to most appreciate the love God has for us and understanding unconditional love for children. The provision we have in Christ, I summarize in the term affection. As adopted children of God, we enjoy the same status as Jesus himself. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, danger, or sword. All of these things were things that Paul had experienced and would experience again. To be beaten with rods, to be flogged in those times was often in itself a death sentence. 39 lashes would often result in infections and and complications from which the person would die. and That happened to the Apostle Paul on numerous occasions. Tribulation, persecution was very tangible for him. Stoned, apparently, to death on at least one occasion. Three times shipwrecked, spending a night and a day, a day at sea, exposed to the dangers of the ocean. When he talks about famine and nakedness, He's thinking about prison. Prison in the first century was not three meals a day and a roof over your head and access to a library and a fitness center. 
Prison in those days was a very simple accommodation chained to a Roman guard, and the only food you got was the food that your loved ones brought to you. The only comfort you had with a blanket or a cloak is what your loved ones brought for you. So without that care from people in the region, you were exposed. You were naked, literally naked. You were famine. You were hungry unless people brought you food. This is why he wrote his letters like Philippians saying, thank you for sending me food and a cloak. Very tangible realities for him. Nakedness, danger, and sword. This is the affection that we have, even in the face of persecution, tribulation, and suffering. We know that we are the beloved and precious children of God. What does it mean to be a child of God? It means access to our Father, right? It means the affection of a Father for us. It means relationship. It means security. It means blessing. And that's our final gospel truth for today is abundance. How will he, along with him, not graciously give us all things? God the Father who did not withhold his only Son has given us in Christ not only salvation, not only forgiveness and eternal life, he's given us every spiritual blessing in Christ. The thief comes to steal and kill and destroy, but Jesus says, I've come that you might have life and have it abundantly. This is the provision God has for us. In Christ, we have everything. So our application, coming back to where we started, is to fear nothing and use everything for for Jesus and his kingdom. It's the application of Romans 12.1. In view of the mercy of God, I urge you, Paul says, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, to say, whatever I am, whatever this body has left in it, here it is, Lord, for your service, for your use. I don't care what mortal man might try to do to me. We should fear nothing and use everything for the glory of God, for the advance of the gospel. I want to close today with a story of a Presbyterian hero named John Patton. I hope you know that name. If not, you'll know it after this. I I found this story uh, in a John Piper book called Filling Up the Afflictions of Christ. If you've not found The Swans Are Not Silent as a series of of triple biographies, beautiful, uh, great gift for pastors, actually, uh, because it's filled with these accessible stories. Here's the story of, of John Patton. Born to two Presbyterians in Scotland in 1824, Parents so devout and God-loving, he saw his father pray three times a day in his prayer closet, pulling the family together every evening for family prayer. So he grew up every day of his life not only seeing his father pray, but hearing his father pray for the glory of God, for the experience of the love of God in his household. So when he was called to missions, of course, his parents were supportive of that. He spent 10 years in Glasgow being trained and doing ministry, urban ministry among the poor as he learned medicine. He was practicing it there and had a fruitful ministry. But when the Lord called him overseas to go to islands off the coast of Australia, then called the New Hebrides, his parents were completely supportive. They were thrilled to see his obedience to the call of God. Even though those were islands where the previous missionaries who had gone there had been killed and eaten in the first 10 minutes on the island. Now, we celebrate a man today named John Williams, right, as a composer. The original John Williams died on the New Hebrides as a missionary in the late 1700s. John Williams and James Harris. John Patton is our hero today, but the true heroes of the New Hebrides were the two who went and were immediately killed. And hearing about this, here's what Patton said as he was setting sail and arriving close to the shores. He said, thus were the New Hebrides baptized with the blood of the martyrs, and Christ thereby told the whole Christian world that he claimed those islands as his own. Did not use that as an excuse to not go, but saw it as part of God's confirmation that those islands had already been consecrated for the Lord Jesus Christ. 50 years later, there are 85 islands there. They only knew of 30 at the time. 50 years later, one entire island would be entirely professing Christians. All 30 of the islands they knew about had access to now a a church and a missionary station. 
And obviously they laid the groundwork to reach the other ones as they discovered them. But it would come at tremendous cost. As soon as Patton arrived at the New Hebrides with his very pregnant young bride, she soon gave birth and soon after that died of complications of giving birth and that their first son also soon died early and, and obviously very young. So his first four years on the island were grieving the loss of his wife and his newborn son in a culture that was completely opposed to the gospel. They were so superstitious that anyone from the outside was viewed as an immediate threat to their spiritual balance, I mean, witch doctor type stuff. So his first four years were constantly on the run, constantly hearing footsteps, literal footsteps outside of his house, and praying to the Lord for protection every moment of every day. Even before he went, one older Presbyterian, God bless him, right, wrote to him and said, don't go, you'll be eaten by cannibals. I love this response. He wrote back to Mr. Dixon, you are advanced now in years, he said. Your own prospect is soon to be laid in the grave and there to be eaten by worms. I confess to you that if I can but live and die serving and honoring the Lord Jesus, it'll make no difference to me whether I'm eaten by cannibals or by worms. There's a perspective for us, right? And he said, in the great day, my resurrection body will rise as fair as yours. In the likeness of our risen Redeemer. That's the confidence that he brought. Nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. And as he hid one time in a tree the natives gathering around him, hunting for him, and somehow not finding him in that tree. He felt a special peace from the Lord, a special assurance, even as he fled for a couple of years and got on a boat and, and, and left and then uh, came back. He felt a special peace and assurance. He said it like this, My peace came to me like a wave from God, and I realized I was immortal till my master's work in me was done. Not a musket would be fired, not a club prevailed to strike us, nor a spear leave the hand without the permission of Jesus Christ, whose is all power in heaven and earth. He was so confident in the sovereignty of God, even if it cost him his life. I am immortal until my master's work with me is done. Those are the words that Jim Elliott would quote in 1950 when he left and he told his parents, grieve not that your children seem to abandon you, but rejoice to see the will of God. He said, he told his friends, we are immortal until our work on earth is done. At the end of his life, not only burying his first wife, Mary, and their first son, but his second wife would also die over there after 40 years together. Ten children she gave. The heroes of this story are Mary and Maggie, by the way. John Patton, but credit to Mary for going, even if it cost her her life. Credit to Maggie for going back and staying 40 years, giving birth to 10 children, four of whom also died in infancy. So not only staying in the ministry, a difficult, dangerous ministry for 40 years, but raising six children in that, and seeing slow but then eventually significant response. At the end of his life, the 83-year-old John Patton would say this, Nothing that can now befall me makes me tremble. On the contrary, I deeply rejoice when I breathe the prayer that it may please the blessed Lord to turn the hearts of all my children to the mission field, to live and die in carrying Jesus and his gospel into the heart of the heathen world. That was Patton's prayer for his own children, and I think it's his prayer, and it's the prayer of the Lord Jesus for us today, that we would fear nothing and use every minute we have, every relationship we have, every resource we have in service to the king, and his kingdom. Brothers and sisters, we have nothing to lose. We have everything to gain. There are lost people all around us who if they think they understand the gospel, but so often they have no idea how good the good news really is. What do we have to lose? A little awkwardness in the workplace? A little embarrassment if a conversation doesn't go exactly as we think it will? Oftentimes these fears are more in our mind than they are in actual reality. Let's be fearless as we bring the gospel not only to our neighbors, but to the nations. It's encouraging to hear, if you've not heard of finishing the task, that's my hope is that Tampa Bay for Christ will become a leading contributor to finishing the task. Rick Warren took over as the director for that in 2020, 
And um, I was just looking this week. There are only 144 remaining unengaged people groups. That number was 2,000 five years ago. There's only 144 left. 35 of them are to deaf people. One of the missing evangelistic uh, resources has been to deaf communities all over the world. 144. That's population, you know, over 500 and stuff. But the, the work is being done. The Great Commission is nearing. The finish line is near. And we have the privilege of being a part of that, both in prayer and our evangelism and supporting of missionaries and increasingly in going and going to the nations. Let's pray.